Okay. Good morning to all of you um, in Europe and good afternoon, late afternoon for those who attend in uh, Japan. Very welcome at this uh, Ucomps uh, webinar, a really special one um, because it takes place in two different continents um, and you will learn about how to work with the informal network in the Netherlands and in Japan. So that's a really special occasion. Um, and as always, of course, we start with music. And this time the music comes from Japan. So we both have an introduction music and later an intermezzo. And the short explanation before we start the music. Um, it comes from the psychiatry department of Yoyogi Hospital. This is a general hospital and department in central Tokyo. And was established in 1946. And they have a chorus there. The Heartbeat Chorus began, began in 2002 with a nurse, a psychologist, and a piano that met at the Yoyogi Hospital Psychiatric Daycare. And despite having a disability themselves, there are no barriers to singing. And through expression, they've created Singing is Living. And they've continued on the road to recovery by realizing that we are not alone. So we really hope you enjoyed their performance, although it was limited by the corona disaster. Um, Ovidio, can you start the music?
Well, thank you so much, uh, Heartbeat Chorus from uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, patients working on re recovery with singing and decided when they couldn't sing in Corona, they could still hum. Very nice and beautiful opening of this uh, webinar. <clears throat> um, welcome to the almost 150 participants, both from Europe and from Japan and other parts of the world. Welcome to this webinar. And this is the first webinar of Yukums in two languages. It will be both in Japanese and in English. Maybe you've already found your way, but this slide explains that um, there's a bar below on your Zoom screen and there is an icon that says interpretation. And there you can select either English or Japanese. So if you haven't done that already, you can do it now which means that you can follow the whole webinar either in J Japanese or in English, because we have two simultaneous interpreters who did this enormous job of interpreting everything that's being said in this webinar. So language is not a barrier here. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome to the audience and uh, this webinar that is um, dedicated to working with the informal network. And then we in the preparation, we have a connection between Yukons and the group in Japan, and especially the person of the, uh, Takashi Isida has become really dear, like a dear friend to me, um, because he's so much involved in community mental health uh, in, in Japan. And then what we discovered is that we both, on the different parts of the world, work on ways to closely work with the informal network, family, friends, carers, neighbors. Um, and that's a very important part of recovery. Recovery is something that you do together with your network. And then we were struck by the similarity of these methods that were developed on different parts of the, of the world. And then we thought we want to share that with a larger audience in a Yukon's webinar. So that's what we do today. Um, and first in this webinar, we will go to the Netherlands and um, so I will uh, give over uh, the floor to Niels Miller and uh, Django uh, Tewis. And after that, we will go to the situation in Japan. In the second part of this webinar, we can uh, deal with all your questions, topics, remarks. And therefore, also in your bar on Zoom, you see that there is an option for Q&A, questions and answers. And as we have a large audience, already more than 150 people, the best way to ask your questions and to put your comments uh, is by writing them in the Q&A. So we will check on what's there in the Q&A. And then the second part, we will have the interaction uh, with that. I hope that's all clear. And also, if it's not clear, then, uh, well, then of course, put your questions and comments in the chat. Um, Ovidio Onichuk, who does the technical part of this, and I really thank him for that effort, uh, can deal with that and can also help you if there's any problem in the connection or the language or the interpretation, uh, let us know. Um, then I said, I will uh, first go to the situation in the Netherlands and hand over to Niels Milder, who will tell us about the methods of working with the informal network in the Netherlands called the Resource Group. Niels Milder, can I give you the floor, please? Thank you, uh, Rene. Um, hello, everybody. Great that you all join. Um, my name is Niels Mulder. I'm a psychiatrist, a professor of psychiatry in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. And I would also like to introduce Django Tewis, uh, an expert by experience. Django, could you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Django. I'm uh, one of the people who did like the first pilot of the resource groups here in Netherlands. 
um, and that's why I'm invited to provide some information how it was for me. Yeah, thank you. Um, you will um, follow me after I introduce the concept of the resource group um, in my presentation, the resource group as a way to operationalize network psychiatry. Django will be back in a minute. Let me share my screen. Is this visible for everybody? Okay. So network psychiatry is the broader term for how we can work with the formal and informal network. And uh, I will start that I had uh, time about which helped me to, to de decide what are good uh, innovations in care. And it's this, this phrase, end of the day, each patient care is only as good as the care that is actually, as the care that is actually delivered. Care is delivered in clinical microsystems without the basic building blocks of healthcare. So, the quality of care is as good as the service user actually experiences his care. One can visualize it as follows. In psychiatry, we have a medical microsystem. This, this picture is from the somatic care, of course. Patients, doctors, nurses, and other medical staff working together to provide the care. But especially in psychiatry, but also in somatic care, of course, we have to collaborate with the social system, with significant others, but also with professionals from the social domain, providing people with housing, finance, etc. So we have to collaborate in these two systems. And that is what network psychiatry is about. Network psychiatry is an attempt to combine principles of recovery-oriented care as well as evidence and practice-based care. It's also an attempt to give a practical solution for dealing with complexity because most of our service users don't have one problem, but they have more problems that they need help with. And we want to work across the medical and social domain. The recovery vision is central in the network. And the service user, and Django will tell about this more in a minute, is seen as the director of his own care process. Nothing about us without us is the phrase that accounts here. It's a cooperation with significant others from the start, from the first start in the mental health system. And we do this in uh, a format called resource groups. And we will, in a minute, we will also hear the Japanese version of this. Uh, but it's a collaboration, a cooperation together from the start. It's a collaboration, as I said, between both the medical psychiatric domain and the social domain on the level, and that's very important, of the service user in the form of the resource groups. But to facilitate this, we need to collaborate also on the level of institutions. And we need to stimulate the mutual dialogue between the different systems, between the different domains, domains with respect for each other perspectives. And it's also a way to provide continued continuity of care by creating a network of formal caregivers and a stable informal network. And this is the resource group. So network psychiatry, it's the collaboration between these domains on the level of the service user to start with. And to facilitate this, we need to also to collaborate on the level of organizations. A little bit about the resource group. It starts when a service user enters the mental health system, it starts with a network intake. Uh, we hope that the service user uh, brings a significant other with him to the intake. And this significant other will collaborate during the care process. The service user, he or she is the director of his own resource group. It's very important. It's not so easy. Uh, come to that in a minute. 
And the service user also nominates the members of his or her research group. So the members are chosen by the service user. And to help the service user being a director of his own resource group, he gets support from, for example, a case manager or a peer worker, because it's not an easy process. So the service user is the director. He nominates his resource group members. They make a plan in which the targets of the service user are formulated. There's a chairman, usually this is the service user himself. The location is chosen by the service user, can be at his home or at another place. And also the frequency is decided by the research group on the direction of the service user. The aim is that the service user, but also the significant others develop ownership of the research group, ownership of the recovery process, and they take responsibility for that. There is structural involvement of the significant others and an activation of the social environment. That's very important. So it's a collaborative process. The service user collaborates with the significant others in the recovery process. And if you have this resource group, you can imagine this, this creates a continuity of care because this resource group can exist over longer periods of time. In the end, the aims of the resource group is to create a resilient network to develop together with the service user, the recovery process, but also to manage crisis situations and to help the service users in these situations and to develop mutually uh, meaningful roles. So the black spot on the left top, left top is not necessarily the service user, but also can also be a significant other who needs help from the resource group. We did a study on the effects of resource group, uh, resource groups in a total population of about 170 people. And 160 people, they were randomized uh, by fact and fact plus resource groups with the primary outcome being empowerment. You can look up this publication in Yama Psychiatry at the end of last year. This is the primary outcome. We investigated the level of empowerment. The red line is the level of empowerment that service users experienced in the regular care control group, which was FACT teams in the Netherlands. And the blue line was the level of empowerment they experienced while having a resource group and directing their own resource group as an add-on to the FACT team. And as you can see, there was a large increase in the level of empowerment for those who had a resource group. And perhaps Django will tell a little bit about how he felt having his own resource group. This was a very important result for us. And this is why we are now implementing resource group in the Netherlands at several places. To end, uh, network psychiatry so is first on the level of the service user, as I explained, but to facilitate this, we need to collaborate also on the level of organizations to facilitate professionals to work in this way. And this is a typical Dutch slide, perhaps you can see left top, the general practitioner where the patients in the Netherlands first have to go to. And then they can be referred to, for example, ACT, which is uh, the cover of the green book at the right. And then the FACT teams can start developing a resource group, which is in the middle. The social domain in the left is also involved and other parties, recovery academies uh, and other parties are <clears throat> involved in uh, working this way. And what we want is this red line across all these organizations that they know how this works, they know that resource group are a normal phenomenon, that service users are directors of their own recovery process. And if everybody in the system knows this, then um, there's the highest chance that the resource group will become successful. So to conclude, must everyone have a resource group? Of course, it's not a heal all or a panacea, 
but uh, in uh, three quarter, 75% of the cases, we uh, could be successful in setting up a resource group. And this can really help. Of course, you need to make the resource group custom made, uh, tailored to the needs of the individual service user. And um, we found that recovery, the recovery process is specifically a social process, as well as an individual process, of course, but having these resource group in place, this really facilitates the recovery process. So questions could be on the chat, perhaps, if you have them. And then I would like to introduce, we can end the presentation, I guess. And I would like to introduce Django, which already did a little bit. Uh, Django, thank you very much for being with us today and uh, willing to answer uh, some questions and tell a little about your own experience. Uh, <clears throat> first, as we talked about, we prepared some questions. Uh, you could, of course, tell us freely about what you want. But first question would be, what made you want to start the resource group? Um, for me, it was uh, because I had a case manager, which I've been working with for quite some time. Uh, and she proposed to me that there was like a new pilot about uh, resource groups. And she thought it would really be really fitting for me. Um, and for me, it was, uh, it sounded quite healthy, as in you would involve your um, social peers, your social network. Um, so that's, it sounded really, sounded good to me. So that's why I started it. Yeah. It was something new for you, wasn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've been uh, I've been involved with mental health care for um, over six years, more or less. Uh, and this was a new approach, and it, it sounded really quite fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did not prepare this, but just could you tell the audience why you were in mental health care? What the reason was? Um, in 2012, I had my first psychosis. Um, and after that, I went into recovery. And of course, um, you also have to reintegrate into society after you have psychosis. Um, and then a few years later, I had my second psychosis. Um, and that's why I got uh, uh, long-term healthcare because yeah, I, was, I was prone to get psychosis quite easily. Well, not easily, but like a bit more easy. Um, so for me, it feels like, a, like I, have, I have a safety net of network around me to uh, discuss my stress levels, um, stuff that works and doesn't work for me. Uh, so that's why they also thought I was quite a fitting candidate for this for this resource group uh, pilot. Yeah, yeah. Who did you invite into your research group? Um, I first started with people who were close to me, my mom and my dad, because they've been through the whole process of me being sick. Um, uh, and because everything was quite new for me, I tried to uh, keep it close, close to home. Um, which the people that are also always are there at my case manager, uh, uh, a nurse specialist for mental health care. Um, and one or a few times my psychiatrist was there. So I had like a, 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 like a solid base of people that are always there. And then I could invite more people uh, that would benefit uh, the issues that I was facing. So for example, I was looking for work. I was invited my job coach. Um, at some point, I invited my girlfriend um, to join the meetings because I'm living together with her and it might be a good idea for her to know um, which difficulties I face now and then and for her to also get clarity from professionals. So that was also really helpful for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did those people who, did, who you invited, especially your family and girlfriend, how did they react when you invited them? Um, yeah, in a positive way. Um, first, uh, I gave some insight of what, what this resource groups mean for me, uh, how, how it benefits me. Um, and yeah, they've been in, involved in my life for quite some time. So um, they also saw how it benefited me. Um, so they were definitely open to, to join the process. Were they surprised to be invited? Um, yes and no. Um, I think also it does not only benefit me, but also it benefits them because they get more insight in my recovery process and stuff that is going on in my life. 
uh, and how I uh, try to tackle some problems that are facing. Yeah, yeah. So they all uh, wanted to join, and did you feel that you were leading your own resource group? Were you the um, director of your own resource group? Uh, well, that was like uh, quite uh, the the initial the. Uh, the first objective from the start actually for me to to lead the process so what we did every um we planned a meeting once every three months uh, and before the meeting started the week before i had with my case manager i had like a a meeting small meeting to discuss uh, small term goals and long term goals um and we also discussed hey who do you want to be there how are you going to achieve those goals um, but what is it that I need from them, from, from my health caretakers and from the people around me? Uh, and also, what am, am I going to do with it? Um, and we also discussed, hey, do you want to take lead in the meeting or do you, uh, where do you want to have the meeting? Because for me, it worked really good to have the meeting at the healthcare center because there was more space. But there were also moments that I invited people in my home to have a bit more uh, at ease, uh, the atmosphere is more different because it's my place and I feel safe here. Um, but I could also imagine for some people it might be helpful to uh, go for a walk with uh, with people that uh, uh, are joining the resource group. Uh, as long as uh, the the client is more safe in this environment, I think that's important. Yeah, yeah. So you you had the feeling that the resource group was your group and you could. Um direct this in a little in, in, a, in a way uh, yeah definitely um, especially right now uh, I've been involved with the resource group for a bit over one and a half two years and I really felt I gained more control and confidence in my healing process uh, also I gained more confidence because I discussed small problems or big problems in the meetings um, and it gave me confidence to now also tackle problems by myself because first I got guidance, but it was still me who was uh, taking charge of the of my healthcare. Um, and by doing that more and more, you gain confidence, small bits. And right now, uh, things that used to be big problems are now small problems. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. So this was one way that the resource group helped you in a way yeah become a bit more independent as well definitely yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. and also uh, i found out uh, which people in my surroundings i could reach out for if i needed help uh, by creating these resource groups and um, the people that i could reach out for help they were already involved in in my healing process in my uh, in, in my recovery how did you experience the group meetings, because I can imagine that it could also be stressful having these people in one room and discussing your own personal goals. Um, sometimes it was a bit stressful because, uh, uh, for example, my parents are divorced and they are still in the same room. I don't know something, some stuff that I uh, discussed with my caretakers, my case manager, for example, my psychiatrist. Um, uh, normally I always discuss stuff only with them and now it's like in a whole meeting with everybody uh, which makes you also feel a bit vulnerable sometimes because you show uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah yeah that, that was Did sometimes quite difficult to be vulnerable members with also. Also. sorry yeah yeah did the people, your uh, family and girlfriend, did they also talk about their uh, goals and, and, and <clears throat> uh, their own emotions? Yeah, not necessarily goals, but they are, uh, they definitely could also, it was a safe place for them to also open up and share their experiences with me being ill, uh, which is also a big part of, uh, for them, like I can imagine, because I've been sick for like quite a while, and I don't want to say that I'm the victim, but I was, I was the one who always had like difficulties in my life. Um, and yeah, either way, how you turn it, it also affects them a lot. 
And then those research groups were also a place where they could uh, kind of open up in a safe place to share how, how difficult it was for them to see me being ill and sick and struggle with stuff. Yeah. So it also helped me open uh, my relationship with my, uh, with my family. My, uh, yeah, it was uh, really beneficial. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. Do you have any suggestions to improve the resource group method? Um, for me, it, everything worked quite well uh, because I have a good relationship with my case manager. Um, she really guided me through the process and made me feel uh, empowered by the decisions I made. Um, what helped me is what set up small goals and from those small goals, she eventually reach bigger goals, which really helped me. Um, and what I think is important is every client has a different approach in how their own healing process works. Um, so what works for me does not necessarily work for someone else because uh, I find it quite easy to take charge of the meeting to say like hey uh, thank you everyone for coming this is uh, my mom this is my case manager and introduce everyone but I can also imagine for some people it might be more difficult um, uh, because they're uh, less confident or uh, yeah like I said some for some people it might be easier to be in an open atmosphere and go for a walk or yeah, what works for them. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Django, for uh, telling you, uh, telling us about your experiences. We'll see you back at the end of the meeting. And uh, thanks again. And I'll give the word back to Renee. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Niels. And thank you very much, Django. Beautiful example of learning uh, together. So I think you ex explained really well, Niels. And, uh, but indeed, in the end, it's what a person experiences and that uh, was very clear from uh, jungle story so i'm really happy that you're ready to share that uh, with us for this uh, large international audience uh, jungle need and we will get back to you and hear more of your input about the webinar on the end uh, of it because the first and last words are always for the peer expert in our meetings um again for those maybe who entered later and this is a bilingual uh, webinar it's in japanese and english and uh, so you can select your language um, because at the, at the downside bar of the Zoom screen, you will see interpretation and then you can choose for either English or Japanese. Uh, so you can all follow it in your own language. Um, we now move all the way from the Netherlands where it's late in the morning to Japan where it's late in the evening. And uh, no, not late in the evening, late in the afternoon, I mean, and uh, therefore, also, we did this webinar at this time. And I would like to hand over uh, the floor to Takashi Isida, who will welcome you and introduce the Japanese speakers. Takashi Isida, please. Hi.皆さん、ご紹介ありがとうございました。私は精神科医のイセダ高志です。東京都立多摩総合精神保健福祉センター。レネ警会長 1958年以来幾多の試練を経て発展してきた生活認証にとって先人たちと喜びを共にするものです。さて、今日は生活認証の概要と実践報告をします。生活認証の概要は精神科医で東京都立精神保健福祉センターの元所長で、現在は群馬県にある中野城病院副院長の小川和夫先生が報告します。実践
精神保健福祉士の西田智子さんが報告しますなおこの生活認証の企画は東京都医学総合研究所の社会健康医学研究センター長の西田敦先生を事務局とする、えー、生活認証研究会の活動の一環でありまして、えー、今回の企画ではパネリストのほかに長谷川健一先生鈴木和弘先生西田哲先生が準備に当たりました。えー、それでは小川先生よろしくお願いします。あ、皆さんこんにちは。ただいまご紹介いただきました精神科医の小川和夫です。えー、今回ユーコムズのウェビナーで、えー、生活臨床を紹介する機会を持てたこととても喜んでおります。えー、生活臨床という用語についてなんですが、えー、最初にちょっとご説明しておきたいと思いますが、えー、文字通りにはこの生活はライフですねだから臨床はクリニカルプラクティスということですしたがって、えー、生活臨床はクリニカルプラクティスインライフということになりますがえー、より本質的な特徴はこの生活の場で病状を見立てて生活の場で、えー、この治療するという点にあります、えー、私は群馬大学病院で20年余りにわたって生活認証に携わっておりました、えー、その後東京都で精神保健福祉領域の活動を経て、えー、現在は群馬県の吾妻地域というところで臨床活動を続けておりますで本日は、まあ、こうした経験も踏まえて生活臨床の概要について述べたいと思いますえー、まず生活臨床の誕生の経緯について述べてみたいと思います。えー、1958年、群馬大学医学部附属病院精神・神経科において、えー、統合失調症患者の再発予防5か年計画のプロ,ジェクプロジェクトが開始されました。このプロジェクトは発病早期の患者を対象とし、地域社会の中での治療により、再発を防ぎ、社会適応の促進を図ることを目的としていました。この取り組みは、近年注目されるようになった早期介入とも言えるものですが、当時の時代背景は、強制的入院治療が体制であったということを考えると、画期的な取り組みであったと言えますすなわち地域ベースの治療に徹し良好な社会適応を目標として治療支援関係を築き個別に働きかけることに不信しました本人との納得づくの治療関係を重視しこれを進めるためにも病棟は全開放とし外来治療を強化するとともに、保健師を中心とした地域での支援体制の整備を図りました。また、再発予防といっても、実質は生活破綻予防の観点からのアプローチとなったことです。あくまでも生活に目が向いていたという点に、この取り組みの革新がありました。経過転機の評価尺度が社会適用であったこともそのことを裏付けていると言えます。生活臨床はこの取り組みを通じて統合失調症患者の生活破綻を防ぎ
良好な社会適応を実現する治療支援の指針として誕生したということです。えー、次に、こうして誕生した生活臨床の中心的な考え方について述べてみたいと思います。えー、初期における生活臨床は、社会生活の中で生活破綻や再発につながる独特の行動に着目しました。えー、そしてこれを生活特性として特徴づけるとともに、これを踏まえ、適切な介入を行うことで、生活破綻を防ぎ、生活を安定させることを働きかけの主眼としていました。つまり、生活特性という見立てを重視したわけですが、その眼目の一つは、生活経過と治療過程から二つの類型、すなわち、現実に挑戦し続ける能動型というタイプとですね、応酬して暮らす受動型というタイプを判別して、前者は再発や破綻をきたしやすく、後者は安定し適応しやすいとしたことです。眼目の2つ目は、再発を生活状況や生活上の出来事への反応とみなし、その契機に本人に特徴的な価値意識が関わることを示したことです。ここでの価値意識とは、抽象的、観念的なものではなく、生活に即したより具体的、現実的なものとして捉えられました。例えば、職場の人事異動とか、経済的利害とか、縁談などに際して、名誉とか金銭、あるいは異性などに関わる価値意識が契機となり、しばしば生活破綻につながることが示されました。そして、ある一人の患者さんにとっては、生活破綻に結びつくような出来事があれもこれもあるというわけではなくて、同じような出来事に反応して、繰り返し、生活破綻、再発を起こす傾向があるということが示されたのですが、それはこうした特定の価値意識が関与していることによるものと想定されました。で介入はいずれの場合も生活破綻、再発につながる生活の変化、拡大を抑えることに向けられました。すなわち、受動型では周囲からの請求な生活の変化拡大を抑えること。能動型に対しては、本人自身による生活の変化拡大を抑えることによって、生活の安定を図ることに力点が置かれました。さて、えー、あっと。えー、さて、えー、生活臨床はその後の発展の中では、行動に現れる本人の価値意識がより重視されるようになり、それが支援の中心課題となりました。えー、特に本人の価値意識を反映した生活上の課題に注目し、これを思考する課題と、称して患者や家族への支援の鍵概念として位置づけるようになっていますこの思考する課題は本人が本音で望んでいることそれは英語ではアスピレーションという言葉で表現できるようなものですが実のところ本人自身それを言葉によって表すことは難しいことが多くその実現は必ずしも容易なものではありません。したがって、思考する課題の英語表現としては、パーソナルチャレンジがふさわしいように思います。
この思考する課題の具体例としては例えば患者さんが用品店の息子というような場合ですが、えー、家業の用品店を継いで長男としての役割を果たしたいというようなことを挙げることができます。思考する課題は数世代にわたる家族史における歴史的課題に根ざしている面があることから家族史的課題という文脈で捉えることもできます。ところで、この思考する課題は、その達成が困難になると、生活破綻、再発につながる要因となりうるものですが、実践的により重視すべき点は、それが生きがいと生活の発展につながる原動力でもあるということです。この点を踏まえて、生活臨床は思考する課題を再発の契機となる弱点、として捉えるのではなく、リカバリーを促進する動員として捉えるようになってきています。えー、そこで次に生活臨床の方法上の原則について述べてみたいと思います。えー、まず原則1としては、生活特性に応じた柔軟な支援とということです生活臨床が実践的な働きかけに際して重視する生活特性は、能動型にしても受動型にしても、それ自体は容易に変わるものではありません。したがって、働きかけに際しては、生活特性を前提として、支援者側が柔軟な姿勢でアプローチするということが求められます。そこで、当面、生活特性自体を変えることより、生活特性と生活の場との圧力に関与し、必要性と可能な度合いに応じて、あるときは本人自身に、あるときは生活の場に、そしてあるときはその両者に働きかけ、生活の破綻防止、安定を図ろうとします。ここで留意すべきは、働きかけの主眼が従来の生活の変化拡大の制御ということではなく、思考する課題の達成支援に向けられるようになったということです。で支援がどういう方向を目指すかによって、柔軟な姿勢の在り方もおのずと変わってくると言えます。なくて次に原則2としては、えー、思考する課題の同定と達成支援は本人家族支援者が共同創造で進めるということです、えー、思考する課題の同定は生活破綻再発の契機となった出来事例えば大学受験での失敗とか、不本意な人事異動とか、家計のやりくりの行き詰まりとか、恋愛関係の破綻などを吟味することによってなされます。また、社会生活を通じて示された重要な選択、例えば、進学に際してどのような高校、大学を選んだか、また、就職に際してどのような仕事を選んだか、あるいは、結婚に際してどのようにして相手を選んだかなどとその理由を吟味することによって把握されます。さらに数世代にわたる家族史を聴取しその文脈の中で本人の価値観を理解することによってより深められます。これら思考する課題の同定とその達成支援の一連のプロセスは本人家族支援者が対等な関係に立って、前向きな雰囲気で知恵と経験を出し合う、作戦会議というものを軸として進められますが、このスタンスは近年注目されるようになった、共同創造、コプロダクションですね、と共通するものです。このプロセスでは
、前者は重度のあ、患者は重度の精神障害を抱えるという逆境にあっても、人生の活路を見出し、自分が生き生きすることができるようになります。また、家族も自分の人生と重ね合わせてみることができるようになると、素晴らしい知恵が出せる可能性が広がります。作戦会議を含む支援プロセスそのものが、本人、家族、支援者を十分に励まし、社会的学習の経験になり、これらが総合して効果を発揮するものと考えます。さて、えー、以上、生活臨床の誕生の経緯とその後の発展、および方法上の特徴について述べてきましたが、ここで生活臨床の理念を整理してみたいと思います。生活臨床は、日本で開発されたリカバリー支援のアプローチと言えるものですが、その独自の特徴は、本人の価値観に基づくリカバリー支援という点にあります。このアプローチでは、他のリカバリー支援と同様に、リカバリーには希望が不可欠であると考えますが、その希望は、本人が本当に望んでいること、すなわち思考する課題を同定すること、そしてそれを支援者と共有し、共に実現しようとするプロセスの中で生まれ育つものであるというふうに考えます。それを実践するために、生活臨床では、本人の生活史とともに、数世代にわたる家族史の文脈から、本人と家族を深く理解しようとします。こうしたアプローチによって、本人は自らの力を発揮し、生きがいを感じ、有意義な社会生活を送ることができるようになります。生活臨床は、本人の生活特性を踏まえ、思考する課題の同定と達成支援を共同創造によって進めようとしますが、こうした一連のプロセスがリカバリーを促進すると考えます。えー、最後に文献を一つご紹介したいと思います。昨年、メンタルヘルスソーシャルインクルージョンという雑誌に、生活臨床を紹介する論文を発表しましたので、これを参考にしていただければ幸いです。以上で私の発表を終わります。ご清聴ありがとうございました。岡尾先生ありがとうございました。あのコンパクトにまとめていただき、えー、多少難しかったかもしれませんが、あのそのような理論的な問題を実践でどうするかということで、えー、実践での報告を。えー高野先生と西田智子さんにお願いしたいと思います。それでは、高野先生、えー、西田さん、よろしくお願いします。はじめまして、えーと、心のホームクリニック世田谷でソーシャルワーカーとして勤務している西田智子です。本日はよろしくお願いいたします。えー、早速ですが、クリニックの紹介を、えー、委員長である高野先生からさせていただきます。高野先生、よろしくお願いします。はい、よろしくお願いいたします。えー、心のホームクリニック世田谷の委員長の高野と申します。えー私たちは認知症や重い心の病を持った方への訪問支援を専門としたクリニックです。フレキシブルアクト、いわゆる柔軟なアクトの手法に基づく多職支援を行っています。スタッフはそれぞれ常勤換算で精神科の医師が2名、看護師が5名、作業療法士が3名、精神保健福祉士が 1.2 名、事務職員4名の体制です今回の発表させていただくケースは、主担当が西田さん、主治医が伊勢田先生です。それでは西田さん、よろしくお願いいたします。はい、ありがとうございます。えー、そうしましたら、えー、事例発表をさせていただきます
、えー、思い心の病を持つ親とこの支援から生活臨床を考えるです、えー。まずはじめに、私が支援を行っていく上で大切にしていることが3つあります。えー、1つは、本人のニーズにとことん寄り添う支援です。2つ目は、ご本人の人生史や家族史を紐解いて、価値意識を探ることで、思考する課題を一緒に考え、見つけ、達成支援を行うということです。3つ目は、ご本人を取り巻く生活環境や背景を捉えた上で、強みなどを生かして支援を行っていくことです。では、思考する課題について、もう少し具体的にお話ししたいと思います。第一に、思考する課題は、生活破綻や再発の原因となるものですが、同時に生きがいと生活発展につながるものです。えー、次に、思考する課題を探るヒントについてです。えー、この丸2になりますが、生活破綻をした頃の出来事にヒントが隠されていることが多いです。えー、具体的に使うツールとしては、年表を使っています。次の探るヒントとしては、丸3で、数世代にわたる家族史の影響を受けているということです。ツールとしては、ジェノグラムを詳しく作成することで探りやすくなります。こちらが年表になります。人生史から価値意識を読み解き、思考する課題を探るために、年表を作成して活用しています。例えば、ご本人さんが左で、次はお,あのお母様で、ご主人で息子さんでっていうふうにご本人だけでなく大きな影響を受ける人とかあと社会的な出来事も記入していきますそうすることで調子が悪くなった前後にどのような生活変化があったのかなどを探りやすくなります次にジェノグラムです、えー、家族史を読み解くことでご本人の価値意識に影響している家族の文化などにも目を向けていきます地域ごとで文化が異なるため、出身地とか、生育地域とか、ご家族の職業などもお聞きします。今回発表する方は、50歳代の女性です。ご本人はこの二重丸の方です。現在は夫と息子さんの3人暮らしです。こうま,るまるで囲まれているのは同居という意味です。また、この緑色で色が塗られている方は、えー皆さんから家族史をお伺いした方たちです。塗られていませんが、えー、とご主人からもお話は伺っております、えー。ご本人さんの両親が離婚により、父親とは幼なくして別れています。また、お母様も重い心の病で入退院が多く、このお母様に代わっておばあさんが、祖母が本人を育てました。で母親の調子が悪いと、この祖母も同居できなくなり、調子の悪い母とご本人さんの2人での生活の時期もありました。で中学校卒業後は、ジムや飲食店の仕事を行っていて、え勤めていた飲食店でえこのご主人と出会って、20歳代に結婚し、30歳代で長男を出産しました。次にご本人と息子さんの紹介です。生活史や家族史、訪問でお話ししている様子から考えたご本人と息子さんです。まず左側についてがご本人です。50歳代の女性で重い心の病を抱えています。ストレングスは手先が器用で細かい作業が好き。優しくって気遣いができ、家族思いです。おしゃれで整理がとっても好きな方です。レジリエンスは断れる。忍耐強い、他者への気配りができるです。アスピレーションは子供に元気に育ってほしい、好きな手芸などをしながら家族を大切にし生きていきたい、静かに暮らしたいです。で右が息子さんですね。20歳代男性で、私たちが出会った時は中学校3年生でした。えー、と中学校の初めぐらいから不安とかパニック発作があって、学習障害があります。ストレングスとしては家族思いでとても優しく温かい心遣いができてイメージ力があって運動神経が良くて好き嫌いがはっきりしています
レジリエンスとしては、周りを見てベストと思える選択を常に冷静に考えているところ。自分で決めたことは困難があってもやり通せるところです。アスピレーションは、家族と幸せに暮らしたい。自分が信頼できる人との関係を大切にしたい。ということです。以上のことから、ご本人の思考する課題を次のように考えました。はい、えっ、ー、と、家族を大切にしていきたいが、夫の病気や息子の将来など家族が心配で不安。これは息子が健やかに成長してほしい。で次に、妻や、えーと、妻、母親として役割を果たせていない。これは母親として役割を果たしたいということです。そして、家族仲良く暮らしたいというふうに考えました。具体的な支援内容としては、とっても大きい大きい一つ目が、とにかくご本人が心配している息子さんの支援を行うということでした。で2つ目が、この家族3人で心地よく快適に過ごせるよう、息子さんのお部屋を作るとか、リビングを作るとかっていうようなことをしました。これはご本人からの希望もあって、ご本人と家族と相談して計画立てながら実行していきました。3つ目は、意思決定を当事者が行えるように、家族会議のファシリテーターをしました。こう家族3人という形で話し合う場面が長年なかったこと、ご本人がうまく表現できないことなど、サポートしながらも、家族それぞれが意見を言って、家族で答えを出していかれるよう支援を行いました。えそして現在です。今はフルリカバリーをして2年経過しましたが、家族が安心し生活できるように母親として妻として役割を果たしています。現在の支援内容としては、まあ、本人一人では解決が難しい生活上の問題を一緒に知恵を絞り、作戦を立て家族に働きかけるなど、共同しながら支援を行っています。また息子さんのサポートも必要時のみ緩やかに行っています。えー、それでは、ご本人さんと息子さんに行ったインタビューになります。私が出会った当初のご本人は、雨戸もカーテンもこう閉め切った真っ暗な部屋に閉じこもってました。でこうあるはずもないこうおばあさんのお面が部屋中を飛び回っていて、いるはずのない黒い人影が見えて怖くて仕方がなくて、もう入浴も全くできないし、もう生きてるだけで精一杯で、こう会話もほとんど成立しないような状態でした。でもその中でも、ぽつりぽつりとこう息子の話を聞いてやってっていう言葉が聞かれてたのをヒントにこう関わっていたということです。で、ビデオ、あのインタビューは現在のご本人と息子さんになります。やっぱり。一日がとても長,い長,長,長くもなく短くもなく何を過ごしてたのか分かんないぐらいこもってたので、うん、だって3年間ぐらいは記憶がない感じの朝起きて皮洗って歯磨いてってあるように一日の流れが全然できないんだよね朝食食べたり、うんうん、昼飯食べたり夕,夕飯食べたりっていうこともなんでしてるか分かんないよね。状態うんうん、とにかく覚えてないことの方が多いかな、うん、もう自分の中ではもう3年ぐらいぽっくり真っ白なのよ空白な時間がこう大きくて、うん、思い出そうとしてするとところどころしか覚えてないし、うん、なんでそうなったかって言われたら原因も分かんないのね。その時はね、私にお弁当はなかったの、うん、私にお金を渡して好きなもの買っといてっていうような感じで、うんうん、毎日コンビニ行ったりなん、ねうんうん、なりしててそれを覚えてるんだけど、うん、買い物しててもなんでコンビニに買い物しなきゃならないのかっていうのも分かんないし、うん、ちゃんときっかけがあるよ何あの父さんがね確かね、うん、母さんに買ってきてあのお母さん食堂っていう。あの食品あるじゃないですか、うん、ファミマのねそうそうそうそ,う、うんうんうん、それをあの母さんに
あげた時に、うん、あの母さんが拒否しちゃったのよね、うん、あの拒否したのは、うん、あの母さん食堂のお母さんの部分に多分反応したんじゃないのあそこか自分がそういうことをできてないのを多分心の中では理解してたんじゃないのだからそれを刺激しちゃったもんだから拒否し反応が出たのかもしれないね、うん、この生活で満足してますうんまあ正直言ってしまえばもうやっと前に進むのかなっていうのを思いましたね、うんいや、普通に、すごいあれがたかったですよ。あ,あの、<笑>小説一作品完成させたのも、あの表紙があったおかげだし、あの絵があったおかげで、ね、完成させることもできたんで、それを普通に、ありがたかったです。あれ、結構すごいですよ。あの、本当に、高校に入ってからも、あの、活用できるところがあって、あれは普通にありがたかったです。めっちゃ役立ってましたよ。本当に。<笑>家族なんだからおかしいから一緒に行こうって言ってくれる方の方が良かったかなって、うん、そうすればね気持ち的にも考え方もまた違ったかもしれないけどねうんもちろん心配は心配でしたねとかあれの時もあの時もやっぱり心配は心配でしたよ不安だったね、うん、一緒に病院まで行ってね、うん、ちょっとしんどかったかなって、うん、不安感はありましたね、うん、男の子だしね自分じゃ分かんないことがいっぱいあるのでつらかったろうなってそういうのは思いますよね話,う、うん、話をいっぱいしなきゃならない時期に、うん、あのそういうオーラが出てしまうと。<笑>何もコミュニケーション生まれないしうん,うんそれはそれで辛かったろうなとは思いますけどねだから一番辛かったんですよねあの時がそうです、ね、相談する相手がいないもんですからね、うん、学校行けば保健室ぐらいでしょう、うん、保健室行ったって保健室の先生が頼りになるわけじゃないしだから西田さんとかが来るようになってよく喋るようになって少しは楽になってたんですよ自分的には。本当に肩の荷が下りたかなっていうのはすごい感じてて、うん、まあこれが壊れなきゃもういいかなっていうこの生活で満足してます高校3年生ぐらいになってくるとよ,ようやく落ち着いてきたし自分の気持ちに余裕が出てくるきたせいなのかしんないけど毎日ああこれで普通なのかなってずっとこういう暮らしができたらいいなと思います。いやもうほとんど満点に近いぐらい、うん、私は満足してますうーん 100% に近いぐらい、うん、80かなうん、うん、父さんとの関係を含めてそれ以外は本当にうん本当に入院前に比べたら本当にねよかったいいと思うしようやくね慣れたし接し方も。<笑><笑><笑>そこなんかちょっと違うところがあるから、うんうん、でもそれに匹敵するぐらいに年月が経ったからかなでも普通に満足してるかなうん、うん、自分はこのままでいいと思いますうんそうだねただどうにかして父さんとコミュニケーションは取れたいなと思ってる順調にいけばう,、ね、うん、うん、いいかなこのままの方がね、おかげです西野さ,<笑>さんのおかげだと思いますよ。いいよろしくお願いします。今日はありがとうございました。いいこありがとうございます。こちらこそ。はい、インタビューは以上でした、えー。ご本人がリカバリーしたことで、息子さんはようやくこう母さんをどうにかしなきゃから、3人家族でより良い関係を築きたいという点に目が向けられるようになってきました。
。それではまとめと少しの課題です、えー。支援内容を振り返り、生活場面でのアセスメントや柔軟で重層的な支援を行ったことが現在につながっていると思います。えー、常に本人自身の人生の決定を自分自身でできるようにサポートすることを徹底して行ってきました。これは息子さんに対しても同様です。他に特徴的な点としては、えー、当事者の強みを生かしつつ、望む形を実現するために、医療機関以外とのコラボレーションをして活用するなど、日々悩みながら工夫しております。最後に課題となりますが、日本の場合、家族への支援や入院中のケアなどの多くが無報酬であり、運営上の困難さや普及の妨げになっています。これは施行する課題の達成支援を徹底して行う生活臨床を実践する際にも障害になることがあると思います。えー、発表は以上になります。今回の発表にご協力してくださったご本人、息子さん、ご主人、それから一緒に支援を行った支援者の皆さん、心から感謝いたします。ありがとうございました。ご清聴ありがとうございました。以上です。高野先生、智、えー、子さん、ありがとうございました。えー、支援にもあの相当なエネルギーが必要だったんですが、この動画作成に智子さんは、えー、ほとんど寝ないで何日間か頑張ってくれたようで、大変私としては申し訳なく思っているんですが、まあ、このことについて皆さんに生活認証が何をしているかというのはあの、少しでも理解していただければあの嬉しく思います。どうもありがとうございました。日本からはあの以上で報告終わりです。I'm afraid there is no、uh, sound, so we don't hear the music, and that is really a pity because I've heard it and it was really beautiful, but、uh, we can't hear it now. Oh.
thank you, thank you very much for the for the music and for the wonderful presentations and the video. I think it really uh, became very clear what Sekachu Rinchu is about. And for me again, it's really remarkable that in different parts of the world, some even the words are the same that we use about using the strengths, about the goals. So that is really quite impressive how we could uh, learn from each other in different parts of the world. Now it's time for questions and answers. And um, we don't have time, I think, to answer all the questions. Um, but I would like to ask all the speakers um, that the questions that can't be answered now, that you answer them later on in the middle and that we can put the answers on, on our website. Uh, so that all questions will be answered, but maybe not all in the session. And um, I just select some of the questions that are there. The first one was written in Japanese, but I translated with Google Translate. And the question, I think it would be on the resource group. And the question is, I think there are patients who have difficulty creating a resource group. What kind of patients do you think is appropriate to create a resource group? Maybe Niels Milder, could you answer that? What kind of patients for, is it appropriate to start a resource group, Niels? Thank you, Renee. Yeah, that is a very good question indeed. Um, we learned from our uh, Swedish colleagues where the resource group method is already in place for over 30 years, that like 75 to 80 percent of the patients, severely mentally ill patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, all kinds of <clears throat> psychiatric disorders, are um, able to form one uh, form of resource group. Remember, that a resource group is already a resource group when you have invited one friend or one family member or a neighbor. Uh, and the smallest resource group they said was even the case manager together with the service user. Uh, but they, that's not a real resource group, of course, but there it starts. And then you keep, keep on the agenda inviting somebody from the environment. Um, so the good news is that it, it's, so it succeeds to have build a resource group in one way or another for almost three quarter of our patients. Uh, and perhaps in one quarter, it's difficult, very difficult because the social environment is um, very poor or people are very lonely or don't want to start a resource group. Of course, that can also happen. Thank you, Niels. And I think, yeah, I think the question to have each other was more or less about the same for whom does it fit. So I'll skip this one for now, but maybe you can add to it, Niels, uh, on, on our website. Then I come to the question of uh, Yayoi uh, Tsukamoto. And there was a question to Django. Django, what was your experience of your listening to your parents talking about your you being ill? Django. Um... Uh, of course, the beginning was kind of difficult because they're also hurt. Uh, and not only me experiencing all my difficulties from mental illness, but it also impacts my family members. Um, but I'm really happy it happened uh, because it creates understanding, not, uh, not only towards me, but also towards them. Um, and also creates opportunity to make things discussable. Because if you cannot talk about certain things, it creates issues later on. And what helps me the most with um, dealing with my mental illness is reducing my stress levels and creating a safe space to talk about uh, topics that are difficult to talk about. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, then I have one question. I select one from uh, Katsuhiro Suzuki. The first one in the second syringe, we're looking for a service user's background with a focus on family history. How much do you consider the family when creating a social program in the resource group? Nils. Could you repeat this a little bit? I didn't understand oh. the question quite well. Um, in fact, it's so in, in uh, the question from Japan saying in Sakachi Rinchu, we're looking for service users background with a focus on the family history. And how much do you do you consider the family when you create a resource group? Ah, yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, indeed. Um, a very important aspect of the resource group is that the service user himself or herself chooses the resource group members. So Django did choose his mother, but 
not every person might choose his mother or her mother. Some people might explicitly not invite their family, but invite friends, uh, for example. Um, and um, so the family might feel excluded when they are not invited to the research group. But if the relationship between the service user and the family is disturbed by whatever reason, uh, the service user might not choose his or her family members in the first place. It might have might happen later, but the basic principle is that the service user himself chooses the members of the research group. Thank you. That's a, indeed a key principle of the research group. And um, there were many other questions, but indeed we're already running out of time. So as I said, um, we will pass these questions uh, to the different speakers because they were about the research group, but also about the Sekatsu Rinshu. And uh, so we will ask them to answer those questions, send it to us, and then we'll put the answers uh, on, on, on our website. So um, in fact, it's the starting of a dialogue. And that's also what UCOMS is about. We have different thematic groups. And one of the thematic groups is about network psychiatry. Uh, that was, I think, beautiful illustrated uh, today with these uh, presentations. Um, before I give the final word to, uh, to Django, I want to announce uh, the next uh, meeting that we have, which is, in fact, already next week. So maybe, um, Ovidio, you can share the slide on, on that one. Um, because as you all know, um, there's a terrible war going on uh, in, in, in Ukraine that has major impact, of course, on the mental health of the people living in Ukraine and the surrounding countries and other parts of the world. So we thought it is appropriate that we uh, do a special extra additional webinar on that topic, which will be already next week on what is for us to the the normal time in, on the Wednesday evening, and especially about the surrounding countries of Ukraine and the interaction of emergency aid and the mental health service with uh, contributions from Moldova, uh, Romania, and uh, Poland. So you're very welcome. You can go to our website and join. Maybe I think that's the next slide or video that indicates you indeed. So if you go to our website, you can see uh, oh no this is how you can like us on, on facebook but so if you join our website you can also there register for this uh, for this uh, meeting and this slide is about you can like us on facebook we are present on all social media on linkedin and uh, facebook so if you like this uh, this meeting please uh, let us know and let uh, let us know on 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 facebook um, having said that, the final words of our webinar is always for a person with lived experience. And we were really happy that Django shared his story. And we asked Django to, uh, to wrap up and to give your personal impressions of this uh, meeting. Django. Does everybody hear me already? Okay. Well, first I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to uh, share my story uh, with all those people from Europe and also from Japan. And um, with that said, I think it's really interesting to see that there are a lot of similarities uh, in uh, taking care of patients and clients who deal with mental illness. Um, what I think is really good, what I saw like in presentations from Japan is that uh, we try to dig through the traumas that people experience in their life um, because impactful life events uh, create difficulties later on in life. And if you tackle those, I think that's a really good approach um, to minimize stress levels. Uh, as I said, stress levels for me is creates uh, uh, more room for me being mentally ill. Um, uh, and I also think, uh, I think it's really good is uh, that you build on the strengths of the patients uh, and try to find what the aspirations are and the purpose in their life and how you can reach those uh, aspirations with small steps, with small goals um, based on what the, the patients need. And I think that's really valuable. 
So uh, thank you very much for having me. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Django, for these, uh, for these uh, closing words. Um, I wish everyone in Europe a very fine day and everyone in Japan a very wonderful evening. And uh, we hope to see you again on our future webinars and as I said, the next one already next week on the situation in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.